Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look. Verse 101, class is in session. Pay attention to the teachings that's from Andrew and Derek. I mean, these guys making the killer with no competition. Dynamic duo better than the Hardy Boys and the Dudley Boys. Everybody make some noise. Mess with them, you get destroyed. They cannot be beat. Take a seat. Watch them do their thing on the MIC. Face the feet. They cannot be seen like JC. Oh my goodness, it's in killing spree. Yeah? Pop quiz hot shot. Do you know what you're listening to? You're listening to Wrestling IQ 101 with retrosexual Anthony Green. Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of Wrestling IQ 101. I'm Andrew alongside Derek. What's up guys? And you can follow Wrestling IQ 101 on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Wrestling IQ 101. We're joined by Dangerous Danny Davis. Yeah, yes, Danny sir. Davis. How are you, Andrew? Oh man, we're doing good, man. What's the juice, man? How you been? <laughs> I've been great, man. I've been doing a lot of things, you know. I've been writing books. I've been doing appearances. I've been doing conventions. I've been doing uh, wrestle cons and stuff like that. And uh, with uh, Scott Wilder Promotions and stuff like that. I've been pretty busy. How about yourself? Man, we're doing well, man. We're talking to you. Yeah. You know, we, we just that's, met... that's where I met you, right? I met you the other uh, where did I meet you? In Atlantic City. Uh, yeah, Atlantic City. <laughs> Atlantic City, that's right. Yeah, the boardwalk beat down. What a place that is. Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. a pleasure to finally meet you. I had a lot about you, good, you guys, and uh, I guess half of it's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. You know, being at the convention, uh, so many stars were there. Did you get a chance to connect with some of some old friends, and who were they? Oh, the old, yes, Jesus. Oh, wow, Gangrel was there. Uh, yeah. Oh, man, oh, so many of them were there. That, uh, oh, Jesus. Bill Eady and Barry Dasso and uh, uh, Tony Atlas and uh, the list goes on and on. There were so many people there to, to uh, actually uh, remember, you know, mention names. I mean, there's uh, just so many. Mm-hmm. Fatu was there, Haku, uh, mm-hmm. just a, a number of them. Uh, Abyss was there, you know, that I uh, uh, finally met. I, uh, mm-hmm. He was one of, the, one of my favorites. Uh, he still is, you know, uh, his uh, his gimmick and stuff like that. I enjoy watching him work and stuff like that. So I finally got to meet him and some other great guys, uh, such as you, you two, Andrew and Derek. I met you guys. That was pretty nice. Yeah. And here we are on the, on your podcast. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. We're glad to glad to have you on. Um, do you uh do you, do you do you like watch like the indie wrestling nowadays? Did you get a chance to talk to any of the younger guys? I, I go to Indian. Uh, yeah, India. <laughs> indie, indie shows a lot, and yeah. I talk to the younger guys, and uh, it's so much different. Uh, even in the independents, it's so much different. The, the the training, the education they give them, and stuff like that is. Uh, uh, it seems to me, you don't have a weight class. You can, you know, uh, be eighty pounds, and they give you a pair of boots, and they take some money from you. <laughs> then they say they're gonna train you to wrestle. That's that's the bad part of it. Then there are some other good ones, you know, that take the money and take the time to teach you how to work and how to wrestle and uh, and how to be careful and uh, you know uh, be careful with somebody else who you're working with and and and, and most importantly yourself and not to do goofy things like jump off the top rope or you know at a burning table or jump off the top of the building on somebody or you know you see so much of this on on YouTube and uh, Facebook and stuff like that where guys do the craziest things and end up with broken necks and broken back and, mm-hmm. and et cetera, et cetera, because they don't realize that this is a, this uh, sport or entertainment, whatever you want to call it, it, it takes a, a degree, a, a, lot, a big degree of, of accuracy and practice and training. And if you don't have that training, you just can't throw on a pair of boots and a pair of tights and give yourself a, a nickname and go out there and, and put on a show for people. It just doesn't work most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, the book is Mr. X, you know, the, the life story of Dan, da- Dangerous Danny Davis. Uh, you know, what inspired you to write this book? If you read the book, it's about my my life as a child, mm-hmm. my childhood. It's at it's at Casanova from W O H W, and uh, I I said no because there were so many people writing books mm-hmm. and digging up trash and telling stories about road stories and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and I thought that you know there's too many of them out there now. And maybe we should wait. Well, he came up with a concept where after talking to him a couple of years with phone calls and uh, 
and, and writers and just talking to him when I met him about my life and how I became a wrestler and how, you know, growing up and, and the thing live and, and it went on to where I uh, got into wrestling and then I was a referee and then I was Mr. X and of course, Dangerous Danny Davis. And the book goes on and on about how to inspire younger people, even older people, uh, how to achieve their dreams because their dreams are theirs. You know, and it should be they should be thrown away. And then I became a referee, so I was putting the ring up, driving and refereeing, and then I became Mr. X. I was doing concessions, I was taking tickets, and I learned all this and I did it well. When they asked me to do something, I did it. And if being a street kid, when you see an opportunity, you know how to grab it, you know how to make the best of it. Mm-hmm. And I, I ran into uh, the Grand Wizard, Ernie Ross, who was promoting this ter- up here in New England. And then I ran into Vince Senior, then Vince Junior, and people around the wrestling business. And, uh, you know, they knew as well uh, uh, that I was a street kid. And But they knew that, and I, they understood that I understood the opportunities that were available to me. And I, they just let me do whatever I wanted with them. I mean, if uh, they gave me an opportunity to do something and I failed at it, then, you know, they would say, well, this guy don't give us. Being a street kid, you know, when you have an opportunity to become something you grab a hold of it and you shake it off for, for for whatever it's worth and even more and get as much out of it as you can and you take the steps yeah so you know danny was there anybody who took a liking to you and helped train you like person yeah it's in the book uh, okay. uh there were people that uh took me under their wing and put me on spot shows under the mask under a mask and wwwf i mean i worked for, there was there were uh, independent shows that we used to go to that would put us on Mm-hmm. And uh, and I would work with people under the mask, and they would put me in a of course in a, in a small small uh, environment. You know, it was nothing like you know the big crowds they had in WWWF. But you know, and that's how I learned to wrestle. And they would take me to the gym, and they'd show me how to work out, and they would uh, encourage me, and they would train me, and uh, that's how I became you know in that aspect of the business. And it was years and years before. I was able to even get in a ring with the WWWF as mm-hmm. Mr. X. You know, went over to Vince and said th- that they need more guys like you, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. That, now, that's, you know, something that happened to me early on in my career. Uh-huh. Uh, I was uh, wrestling with uh, and, uh, Bruno and his son. They, uh, they were tagged up together for a while there at one point in time. And it was me and I think it was Steve Lombardi. And uh, they were a little hesitant at first, but when we got in the ring, of course, uh, we did the great. We did a great job. Uh, and afterwards, he said that I was told that Vince wanted to see me in his office, and I was a little. I said, "Oh boy, I must have messed something up, or I did something wrong," you know. And I walked in, and Bruno was there. I addressed his soul, and uh, I looked at him, and I looked at Vince. And I said, "Do you want to see me make the business man?" He said, "Yes." And the girl wants to tell you something. He stood up, shook my hand, and that's what he said to me. He said, I just told Vince McMahon, and I, you know, I said, here it comes. He said, I just told Vince McMahon that they need 100 more guys like you. You did a great job. And he shook my hand, and, and that's it. That was it, man. I thought I had made, I thought I had achieved my dream. You know, I said, that's it. But, you know, there's nothing left. But who knew, you know, what the future would bring? And again, uh, the rest is history. Nice. Now you were uh, during this time you you did refereeing and you also were a wrestler. Uh, I kind of have like a two part question. Were you did you have more of a passion for one over the other? And also, have you ever had to do double duty on any night? Oh yes. Uh, again, there's, there's stories in the book about that, and uh, I guess I can give you a little tidbit of it. I used to drive the ring to an arena. I would set the ring up. I would do concessions. I would go out and I'd referee a match. Then I'd go back and get into Mr. X, and I'd go out and wrestle a match. Then I would get back in I'd, and uh, change into the referee thing again, do another referee match. When the show was over, I'd take the ring down. I'd go do the, uh, count up the concessions and count the tickets up and all that stuff, and then go on to the next town. So I, I did multitasking every night. Sometimes I would do four or five jobs Ooh. a night. Hell, man. That's man. crazy. And again, it goes back to work ethic. You know, you yeah. got to have work ethic in order to get along today. In this, in this world, today, it's even worse. Uh, there are a lot of kids that I don't think would, would, uh, would say the heck with it. I ain't doing all that, you know, stuff like that for very little money, by the way. We weren't getting paid big bucks. You know, we were considered, you know, the ring crew, as it were. And, uh, but I made a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, and uh, I got paid for each job. 
and uh, again, opportunities. And uh, to, you know, you have to you have to uh, forfeit a lot of uh, your time to and invest a lot of time. And there's something you you, you know to, that you want that you want to achieve. Like I always tell somebody, it's your dream. Go get it. Don't let nobody stop you. You know, and do what you got to do to, to get it. And uh, hopefully, the book will inspire a lot of people to do that. Yeah. The one thing I like about this book is that you're, t you're reaching out to high schools and teachers and, you and you're telling them to read this book. Um, you know, how does that feel when, when these teachers and or these high schools coming up, do they, do they come up to you and tell you thank you for this? Well, a lot of them, a lot of them say to me and uh, ask me questions similar to the ones you ask, you know, how it happened and all this stuff. And is this really all really true? And I said, yes, it's, and I can back it up anytime you want me. To. And they say, you know, kids need this. Mm -hmm. Young kids need this. Young adults need this. College kids need this. Because when they go out in this world and they have to get a job in any field that they want to be in or, or they have dreams or they want to achieve something in their life, the whole key to that success lies within themselves and if they don't have the the intestinal fortitude or the or the, or the uh, uh, ability to know and to dig and to dig and to dig down deep and to succeed in whatever, whatever you want to do and it's called work ethic and without that you might as well stay home because they've stolen your dreams yeah, that's definitely true now you've been famously or infamously known as a uh, one of the most uh, crooked referees of all time in history. Um, how did that whole idea come about? Well, again, it was not an idea that was, was developed by anyone. What happened was, as a, as a referee, uh, number one, I was never afraid to or ashamed of or didn't want to do anything that they asked me to do. Like when the women came in or the midgets came in, a lot of referees didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, if a, if a, a heel was going over, the referees said, oh, I don't want to do that match because they all wanted to be a, you know, a fan favorite, all the referees. I didn't care. You know, I would, and when I went out there, I would give as much attention to the baby face as I did the heel. In other words, I legitimately tried to call it down the middle. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I had yeah. no favoritism either way. And somebody, somewhere spotted that and said, hey, this guy don't show favoritism to either one, like the rest of the guys, you know? Yeah. What, what if, you know, what if we, he, you know, we turn him a heel, you know, make him uh, reverse things instead of favoring the baby face? Why don't we see if we, what would happen if he favored the, the, the heels, I guess? So that's what they asked me to do. When you go out there, I want you to do this. And, what, and we did it. And again, it was an opportunity for me to take something that they they wanted to be developed and show the ability that it can be done and done right. And that's what I did. Yeah. And uh, it was a success, as you can, as you know, yeah. and uh, as you just said, I'm the world famous bad guy referee, dangerous Danny Davis. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But, uh, but I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't change anything. Yeah. And how does it? How does that feel to you, knowing like you were in this era when there were like you know the legends that we look at nowadays, like Macho Man, Hulk Hogan, Bret Hart, all of that, oh, and and you had and, and you had such a major storyline during this time. Man, oh man, let me tell you something. I say this on all podcasts. I, I, I repeat it, so it, it comes natural to me now. But that era in wrestling will never, ever be repeated. That was the pinnacle of wrestling. There never will be a time in history that wrestling will ever achieve what it achieved in that period of time. And to be part of that, a small part of it, everybody wanted to be a part of it. But the part I was in was so fantastic to be there. Just to, the, the, the air was, 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 was electric every night. You go out there and the crowds were there and the fans, man. I say this a lot too, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Without those fans, we would be nothing. Those fans were there, rain, snow, sleet, thunderstorms, hurricanes, whatever. They always showed up to to either hate the person they wanted to hate or to love the person they wanted to love. And I'm going to tell you something. Some of those fans you'd see every week or every time you went to that town, it was the greatest feeling to go out there and be part of what was happening in that time. So, Danny, if it wasn't for wrestling, what, would you, what do you think you would be today? Do you think you'd still be I in a position? <laughs> I ask that question to myself every day. Mm-hmm. 
every day I say that to myself. People say to me, you know, will recognize me or they'll come up to me and say, what was it like and, and stuff like that. And, and I can remember, or I'll talk to my siblings, my sisters and brothers, or I'll talk to old friends that I haven't seen in so many years and they'll say, wow, what we did and you know, where would I be? I have, I can tell you today that I can go visit graveyards and cemeteries where a lot of my friends are dead that didn't have, didn't make it, man. That were young, that died in their teens, that died in their twenties because of the things we were doing mm -hmm. and what happened to them. And I think, and, and, and the jails and the, and the imprisonment and, and the incarcerations and the things, the bad things we did, man, I think I would have either been in jail or dead. I don't know, but I know I wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah. And they can say what they want about the wrestling business. Mm -hmm. The wrestling business saved my life. And that's all I can tell you about it. Yeah. yeah. Thank God you're still here and you're sharing this story. It's inspirational. You yeah. Can't, you can't help but smile, Thank you know, and get excited. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> no, no. It's, you know, it's, and I, I get excited every day. Every time I do a podcast, I get so excited. It takes me 25 minutes to calm down. I go out, take a, I take a walk, I drink water because it's it's like reliving the whole thing. You know, the Hulk Hogan era and, and it's, you know, the Hart Foundation and, and there were so many. You mentioned you mentioned Macho Man, and you mentioned you know there were guys that you don't even Andre the Giant, and yeah. you know Bruno, you know all those guys, all of them, man. They were such great, great people, and and they, they worked so hard to develop their craft, and, and even you know I, I'm telling you, it, to, to be part of it is just oof, it gives me shivers just to think about it. But we worked for it, we earned it, mm -hmm. we worked hard for it, and uh, but. Uh, it was worth every 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 minute. Mm. Now, do you do you look at yourself as um, I would say kind of like the the prototype or the model for uh, refereeings and using them in a different style? You know, they use Earl Hebner in different ways. Uh, Nick Patrick, they use him as a hill referee. Do you look at yourself as like the cornerstone that started that? Well, let me answer like this: as you know, in the wrestling business, once something is done an angle is done or a program is done mm -hmm. and somebody else tries to imitate that or copy it, it's never the same. Mm -hmm. The original is always the best. There'll never be another Hulk Hogan. There'll never be another Danny Davis. There'll never be another Kamala. There'll never be another Nacho Man, Randy Savage. None of that. You know, there'll never be another one. Even though they try to imitate them, they try and, you know. So, uh, it's just, you can't, uh, say that I was a prototype for, for other referees. They may try, and it may be semi-successful. They may try, and it may flop. They may try, but nothing is as good as the original, especially in the wrestling business, and I don't have to tell you guys that. Yeah, definitely. You know, one of my favorite things about you was whenever you were with the Hart Foundation, Jimmy Hart, Brett, and Jim the Anvil, uh, how was it being around those guys, you know, all the time? I was around greatest. Think about who I was around. Yeah. Just for one minute. Bret Hart. The Dungeon. The world famous Dungeon up there in Canada. The Hart Foundation. Jimmy Hart. The Mouth of the South who's been, you know, done everything in the world in, mm -hmm. in the wrestling business. Jim the Anvil. God rest his soul. When I heard he passed away, I had tears in my eyes. A great, great athlete. Great man. Mm -hmm. A hell of a guy. And just to be around, you know, just to be around people like that. If you go somewhere and you're around greatness, you know you're around people, you know. You've been around people and you say, wow, you look up to them and say it like that. But to actually live with them and sleep with them and fight with them and, and eat, you know, do the whole thing with them. And you become, you know, brothers, you know, and, and, and uh, comrades. There's nothing like it because you really get to learn about them and you find out, you know, all this persona that they pr portray on the uh, on the, uh, in the in the ring is mostly you know completely opposite of what they who they really are mm -hmm. and uh, so you really get to know them and you really appreciate being around because they're always 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 ready to go and want to give a hundred percent and that inspires you to do better yeah definitely do you do you have any um stories of uh, Jim Nyhart that you could uh, tell us about any great stories or experiences with him no, nothing that's uh, uh, just 
Jim was Jim. Uh, Jim Nighthart was Jim Nighthart. He was, uh, as I say, a great guy, a consummate athlete, uh, knew his craft. Uh, stories about him? No, I don't have any, any, any real. I mean, just goofy stories, you know. Riding mm-hmm. on the road, you may, you know, stop. But uh, we drive off and leave him there, just joking, go around the corner or something. But nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but he was just a great guy, and he took you take a rib and give a rib, and he was the type of guy you would never know if he was ribbing you or not. Yeah, <laughs> right. He kept that same race, and he keep pulling that chin hair, and he look at you dead in the eye all the time, and he, so you wouldn't know. <laughs> and you'd say, "Is he kidding me or not?" You know, you do I did, but no, <laughs> oh, uh, he was a great guy, and great to be around. And he always said to me. And many times he looked, he'd take me aside and we would just be talking and he'd say, you know, there's one thing they'll never be able to take away from us, Danny. They can strip us with titles, they can send us away, they can fire us, but we were in WrestleMania three, the biggest card in wrestling history, and they can never take that away from us. Mm-hmm. And that was his, his, his uh, favorite thing, to be part of the uh, WrestleMania three. Now I try to I try to drop off Andrew a couple of times and run off around the corner, but he keeps coming back. <laughs> oh, geez. Well, I tell you what to do instead of taking off, one of these steps off the curb and run back over. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> we need somebody. Somebody has to book the show, so we need somebody to book the show. <laughs> <laughs> Get the book in so, uh, Danny, when I think of you, man, I always think of that that classic jacket and, and the stripes. Whose idea was it to come up with that look for you, or was that all your own? No, well, believe it or not, it was Jimmy Hart. See, I had uh, uh, what the, what Vince would uh, refer to as jailhouse tattoos being a street kid. Uh-huh. So I had to come up with a long sleeve thing. So because in them days, I mean, they were really bad. I mean, they were bad, and there was no way to cover them. I suppose there was, but makeup and stuff like that. But you know, yeah. so we had a Jimmy came up with a, with the top thing there, which I hated. Mm-hmm. It was so hot. It was so hot. I think it was a rib more than anything. And he came up with a stripes figure and referee. You know, yeah. the striped the striped shirt and stuff like that. We wanted to keep the stripes. I he, he made me get striped boots. So I guess it would be. I would say it would be Jimmy's idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah I you know, uh, I was happy with. It. I didn't care if I wore, you know, a skirt. It didn't matter to me. I was it was a top, and I was we were making money. We we're having fun, and again, it was a great time in my life. That's, funny. That's awesome. Speaking speaking of uh, skirts, um, you were actually on Piper's Pit with Rowdy Piper. Um, can you tell how how was that segment for you, and uh, what what does that mean to you now, looking at it? That Piper's Pit is I, such a classic I thing. That all the time. I, I watch that. Where he punched me at the end. And, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean that was uh, Roddy Piper was so easy to work with, uh, whether it be on the mic or, 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 or in the ring or just joking around with him. He, he was just a, a genuinely a nice man. Yeah. Uh, and I would say that because of, because of these people have, have passed away. I'm t- talking really. He, he, he was business. It was business, too. I mean, you know, it's his livelihood. But anyway, uh, when you step into a ring or, or, or a segment with someone of that magnitude, he can carry you. He can lead you. But, you you know, again, I had no no training with, with uh, being on a bike or being on a stick or anything that they call it, being on a stick. I had no training doing that. I, you know, I just went again. You know, I had an opportunity. I grabbed it, yeah. and I went with it, man. I, you know, and it was to work with him, Roddy Piper. <laughs> uh, you, you gotta. I, I keep saying this. I know, and I don't like to be repetitive because, but these guys are so great. They're so. They know their business. They know their craft, and this is how you learn. People ask me, "How did you learn to wrestle?" Well, you, as a referee, if you were any kind of had any kind of smarts, you'd listen. You'd watch. You'd, it, and you'd be in the right place at the right time, and you'd learn. You'd learn moves. You'd learn counter moves. You'd learn strategy. You'd learn the psycho, you know, how to psych the people out. Psychology. If you just listen and watch, and you know, and when you get in the ring with a guy of Roddy, Roddy Piper's magnitude, man, you don't have to do nothing. 
Yeah. You talk, he'll lead. If it's bad, he'll take the mic from you, he'll start over again, he'll take, go to a different subject. And when I did that with him, it was, uh, again, a high spot in my life. I mean, I'm working with guys who, who are my heroes. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, when I was growing up watching wrestling, you know, and, and you read about them in the magazines, because I used to sell the concession, I'd read about them in the magazines mm -hmm. when I was younger. And here I am in the ring with them in Philadelphia, sold out. I don't know how many thousands of people are there, you know? <laughs> and here I am in a ring with this man, this, 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 this you know, this idol of mine. And, and, uh, and again, you, you, unless you've done it, you, you, there's no words other than great to to describe it because you, you, and to have them go, you didn't have to go back and they look at you and shake and right in the eye look shake your hand and say great you did great man I know what could be better yeah, yeah I hear you you know when you when you're traveling is there like a favorite spot that you like to go to and eat or just chill out or relax when you were traveling there were many 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 spots there was a place uh, outside of, of uh, maryland there on route 44 had ribs that would fall a guy used to have a, a, a barbecue out in back of the restaurant and he would cook them for hours they would fall off the bone he had all kinds of sauces there there were there was a place in uh, albany new york that uh was a french restaurant that very few people went but when that was with andre we used to go to the back door and we would call ahead and they let us in the back door and the family would cook us a whole meal there was another french restaurant and in, 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 uh yeah there were so many uh places that we even you know we would go get tampora at a certain place or, you know or asian food at a certain place uh and every everywhere we went there was a, uh, a place to eat that we would all go to all the majority of us did you ever and we would enjoy did you have a favorite town or favorite crowd of yours personally boston that was my area when I was growing up, Brockton, Boston, Boston area. Yeah. Yeah. I always like to come back to Boston, and I'd look out there, and I'd see people that I haven't seen in a long time, and, you know, to be in the ring and entertaining these folks that I grew up with and said that I would never be nothing, that I would never accomplish nothing, that I would be nothing in jail or dead, and I'd look out there, and I'd be entertaining them in a, in a, in a ring that's such as Boston God, you know, that gives you a little bit of pleasure too. Nice. Now, when it comes to like uh, creatures and things like that, I'm not a big fan. You were in a program with uh, Jake the Snake. Were you <laughs> were you ever scared of Damien and him putting that Thank thing you on God. you? Well, you know, I tell the story a lot, but it, it's a good story. You know, people used to he used to leave it a bag in the dress room, and there were a couple guys there that, or a few guys that would go by and kick the bag, you know. And, oh my God. and it, you know, this would go on like our TVs and stuff like that. And that poor snake would be in it. And so, you know, and they'd be kicking the bag and they would, you know, move the bag around and stuff like that. And by the time you get out there to, to work with Jake the Snake, you know, that, that snake was pissed. Yeah. <laughs> you <know? Yeah. laughs> and you had to work with him. And of course, Jake, you know, being the guy he is, he was, a, he was always and pulling a rib or something yeah. he would put that snake around your neck put it he put it down my pants oh, my would, and you can't move and he'd wrap it around your neck and, and you'd say you you know you'd be saying don't be and you can't move because he just did the ddt and he had to put the snake on you and you're laying there this is that son of a bitch? <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> well it did randy randy savage yeah right it yeah. him in the arm yeah, you know, yeah. And, I mean, you never knew. And the guys would work with them. There were guys that would come, you know, the, 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 the enhancers they call them, today, we call them jobbers. They, they wouldn't work with them. They oh said, no, 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 snake, no snake. That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> but he was, you know, yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, you never knew. But uh, you never knew. And we would get a different snake from different people every time we went in. <laughs> You know, from a pet shop or something. Or he would call somebody a pet shop, and he would. Have, and we don't know where that snake came from. If it was fed that day or whatever. Oh my goodness. Oh, <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, that is yeah, funny. Yeah. yeah. So it was. It was. Uh, it wasn't. Look at you, Jake. That snake. You know, the snake. He did his brother. He just smiled. You know, that smile, the teeth. You know, <laughs> and look at you with the eyes. And I said, Oh Jesus. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it, it was. It was pretty good. Yes. Yeah, and I, that was another thing with Jake. Uh, we had a TV match, and uh, uh, I forget where it was. And we came back, and everybody was watching. 
and everybody said, what a match. And I, you know, I said, what the hell, you know, I, I did anything. Because Jake did it everything. Made the match what it was, you know, and they said, what a great match. You know, either the, 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 uh, the agents and, and everybody were watching and said, wow, that was a great match. I didn't do nothing. <laughs> oh, so, so yeah so you know again it goes back to what I said earlier about working with these professionals these guys that know their craft it's just it's just you know because they don't have to work with you yeah. they can go out there and make you look like shit if they want to yeah. on the other hand too you know they can make you go out there and look like you don't even belong in that's true or they can be professional and go out there and work there's, there's a saying that you know, this guy could work with a broomstick and have a match, you know, that meant, that meant that guy knew what he was doing, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how was it knowing that you, you got to be on baseball cards and action figures and, and stuff like that? How was that to you, and, uh, you know, how much pride did you have in that? I don't, I don't, I don't uh, 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 it doesn't make, make me feel like I'm a, anything special. I'm not mm -hmm. special. Uh, and anybody, all, all those guys will tell you that they're not special. What I did was, I, I achieved the dream mm -hmm. through hard work, and and uh, I was successful again with the help of a lot of guys, a lot of people who would work with me and help me along. And I owe them more than I deserve myself. When I see a picture, of course, it's it's flattering when you see yourself in, on cards and you see yourself in magazines, and people do stories about you mm -hmm. and. Uh, the fans again go back to the fans they come up to you at these conventions and they tell you stories and what they remember and you forgot half of what they're talking about but they remember it was part of their childhood it was part of their life and that's 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 what I uh, appreciate so the cards and the, and the publicity and the, and the movies and the, and the figurines and all that stuff is secondary to what it makes me feel like to know when I'm with these guys and I'm looking around and, and the fans come up to me and that's my pleasure right there that they actually remember and that they appreciate me and uh, tell me I was part of their family life when they were growing up how they all used to gather around the TV and watch me and boy my father hated you or my grandmother hated you and all this stuff and you know it, it just makes you feel so so proud to be part of what happened yeah. So, I mean, what's the goal out of getting this message out of this book? You know, it, if, if it inspires one or two kids, do you feel like you accomplished something? Well, I, I, did, a, I did a few promos about it. And, and mm -hmm. I, I, my theory is this. If I can help a person, a child, especially a young adult, mm -hmm. to live or change their way or their path for which they're going now into something that they really want and dream about and wish for and want to accomplish if one kind one one time one kid comes up to me and said i read your book years ago mr davis and i listened i, I really was inspired by it and I, now i'm an executive at this place or i achieved my dream of being doing this so and i'm not talking i'm talking forget about you know what your hair looks like forget about what clothes you wear just be yourself achieve your dreams that that to me will mean that this book was a success mm -hmm. and that's how i feel about it nice definitely and you were uh, inducted into the uh, new england pro wrestling hall of fame do you think uh one day we'll be seeing danny davis in the wwe hall of fame well i think they wait till you pass <laughs> oh they wait till you die <laughs> I, think, I think it's i think it's more economical for them to say well <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Oh, man. I mean, if you were going to get inducted into the Hall of Fame, yeah. who would you like to see your inductor be? Howard Finkel. Howard Finkel, wow. nice. Howard, yeah, yeah, there's a story in the book about that. And, uh, you, should, you know, when they buy the book and you read it, it me and Howard Finkel are close friends. And, uh, and uh, we have been since day one. 
And uh, a lot of people don't know that. that uh, and uh, I think that he would be, uh, of course, other people that I would have chosen in the past. Mm -hmm. But I think, or, or Jimmy Hart, or, but I think uh, Howard Finkel would be my first pick. Nice. And I got to tell you, I met Howard Finkel twice, and both times he said my name, and I had shivers. I was like, I listened to you in Madison Square Garden. This is amazing that you... You said my name. You know, it wasn't like it wasn't as glitzy and glamorous as as being in an arena, but I still got chills. <laughs> yeah, and that it goes back to professionalism. You know, yeah. he, he knows his he knows his craft. He, he uh, developed a, a way of doing it, and uh, and there's no other person like Howard Frankel. Again, there doesn't ever be another Howard Frankel. I'll always be named as Danny Davis. He'll always be Howard Finkel, and that's the way it is, man. Yeah. Now we we've talked about the past, um, a little bit into the the present and the future. Um, Cody Rhodes, the son of Dustin Rhodes, he just had his event all in. Um, how do you feel about you know like the way the direction of independent wrestling is going now, and how proud are you of Cody Rhodes of his achievements? Eventually, one of the greats of our sport, and uh, without a doubt. And Dustin is no slouch either. Yeah. But Dustin goes his own path, and Cody takes his own path. And that's what I admire about these kids, these two guys. You know, even though they don't try and live off what their father was, they make their own way. Mm -hmm. Cody Rhodes has achieved a lot uh, in the past few months, for few years. Once he left WWE, that you notice. Yeah. And those independent shows that are, are separate from WWE uh, are the shows that I enjoy watching. I mean, if they came on TV, I'd watch them more and more. I appreciate anybody who has the fortitude or the intellect to develop their, this uh, sport the way it's supposed to be. I think that the WWE, and this is all speculation, it has anything on any of these other independent mm -hmm. uh, wrestling outfits. Mm -hmm. uh, they try to put them out of business. They try to run opposition to them. They do everything they can. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's right. And uh, I, that's just speculation. I think that someday you're going to find that things are going to turn. And I think it's going to become very soon because the egos are responsible for where the WWE is heading, and it's not a good place, in my opinion. Because yeah. once Vince, Vince McMahon goes, whenever that may be, that'll be the end of, uh, in my opinion, that particular outfit. Yeah. You know, I don't know who, who else will feel that way, but if you watch, and I watch it maybe once or twice, Every six months, I'll mm -hmm. turn it on, I'll flip through it, I'll see it, and I'll stop. And it's the McMahon show. Mm -hmm. You know, all the same guys. I didn't watch it for a year. I turned the TV on. It was the same group of guys wrestling different. I didn't know who was who. You know, I mean, I knew who they were, but I, now he's a baby face. He's a heel. I mean, what the hell? They're the same guys. Yeah. You know, different outfits, different, you know, different gimmicks. I said, what the hell went on here? You know, and I, so I just, I just changed it, you know. And I, I, I'm not, I'm not really thrilled with it. And I don't know what they can do to turn it around. I don't feel they have any anybody there that can one big uh, uh, star, one big talent uh, to carry the ball for them. And uh, I don't think they're going to find it. Yeah, I mean it's crazy because you you stood across the ring from Hulk Hogan and, and uh, Billy Jack. I mean, how was it getting in the ring with those guys? Uh, it goes back to what I said earlier. It's it's a it's a, it's a, it's a something that you can't describe. I mean, there I am with Hulk Hogan, yeah. and here I am, a street kid, not too long ago, you know, fighting, you know, in the street for yeah. for you know, enough money for a pack of cigarettes or whatever. And uh, <laughs> years later, here I am in the ring with one of the biggest stars, in, in my opinion, wrestling ever had or ever will have. Again, I mean, there'll never be another Hulk Hogan again. It goes back to what I said earlier, yeah. and there'll never be another time that we will experience in our lifetime that will uh, duplicate or even come close to what we what that period of time was. 
Now, uh, in a dream scenario, what would be the match that you want to be the referee for? And another scenario, who would you want to face from today's generation? Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes? That's not yeah. bad. That's a good tip. <laughs> Uh, uh, Cody Rhodes would be someone that I would love. If, you know, of course, I'm a lot older. He was, he, he, you know, but uh, that he is. But uh, I think that I admire that kid, and uh, I think that uh, if I was ever able to do that, I think him or his brother Dustin, mm -hmm. I would really enjoy that match uh, because I know that we wouldn't have to do nothing, and we would build it up. And uh, we would have a match that would uh, be memorable for for a long time. Nice. Now I know this is going to be a hard question, but is there anyone you could pick as your favorite opponent of all time? Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy! <laughs> well, I have to say, uh, I worked with Macho, Macho Man Randy Savage. But yeah. I think Bruno San Martino has to has to be the one that I I. I, I will always, until my last breath, remember that day and me actually locking up with, uh, again, my childhood hero. Uh, to be in the ring with him, to actually compete with him is, uh, I mean, how do you top that? And then to get a compliment like that from him. You know, I saw him at WrestleMania 30. Mm -hmm. And he came up to me, and he was sitting with a bunch of guys. He said, "Hey, hey, Danny, come on over!" And he told that story to everybody there. He said I was in my fifties. This kid was in his twenties, and I beat his ass. <laughs> 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 he never forgot that. He never forgot that match. Oh man! That's he never funny. forgot it, and he always remembered that match. And that, how much more compliment can that be for a man like that of that magnitude to remember one little guy? That one person out of all the years that he wrestled, that one particular night in Poughkeepsie, New York, that he wrestled in a tag match with his son and I was one of the opponents. That's he crazy. remembered it for his whole life. Man, that is absolutely Abs incredible. <laughs> Isn't that something? Absolutely. Hey, think about that. How do you top that? So, yeah, I would really like to go there and kick his ass because I, now I know he's older than <laughs> <laughs> God rest his soul. Yeah, he's a very kind man. I got to meet him for sure. So, um, oh, what, a, what a guy. He was a real, real, a real man, a real gentleman. That's awesome. So can you tell people where they can pick up the book and, and how they can maybe follow you on social media if you're on social media? I am, I am on, uh, you can like me on my page, Dangerous Danny Davis on Facebook. You can like me there. To get the book, you go to DangerousDannyDavis.com, follow the link. To the, where the book is being sold, it's like a little store. It'll come up where you can, uh, you know, read about it, and then uh, you can add it to your cart, and uh, and you can do it through PayPal. You can pay it, pay it through PayPal, and uh, uh, you can get it at. Uh, oh, where else can you get it? Uh, Amazon has it. You can get it there. But uh, I like when people like me on my page, and then go to DangerousDanny.com and and order the book. And you can go to W O H W Publishing too, Kenny Casanova. You can get the book there too. But uh, I like it when I it comes up on my phone that so and so has, has purchased the book, and I send it out from here. Oh. I send it personally to him, and I sign it personally to him. Oh wow! And it don't come from a factory. It don't come from you know Kenny Casanova. It comes directly from me, and nice. I like that better because I can put little notes in there, you know, and say thank you for you know. Hope you enjoy the book. Please let me know what you think. And I have gotten so many calls and so many texts and so many messages and so many things on Facebook. I got one the other day that said, I have to say this. I just, I, I'm reading Dangerous Danny Davis' book today and I can't put it down. What a book. And everybody that's read this book has said the same thing. They can't believe it. I've had a woman uh, actually see me at, at one of these these, these uh Inventions and hug me and cry and say that book was so so inspirational. She makes her son read it a couple times and she was in tears. It was it was just it's an amazing book. It really is an amazing book, and I want everybody to buy it. Yeah, definitely. Well, Danny, we really appreciate you coming on our show today, answering our questions, giving us your time, and we just we thank you for everything. Yeah, absolutely, Danny. 
And, and let me ask, let me say this. It's guys like you that help guys from the past, the greats, the really great people in wrestling, the greats, that keep our name out there and keep the fans informed as to what we're doing and how we're doing. And you guys deserve all the credit in the world. And like I said before, you fans are the greatest of all time. And I really, really appreciate it when I could take you guys take time to have me on your show. Thank you very much. And for us, we are Wrestling IQ 101. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can listen across all platforms on the B Plus Player Network. And for us, we're out until next week. See you. You have just listened to the Wrestling IQ 101 podcast, powered by B Plus Player Radio.